So um, no disclosures with this presentation. And this uh, today's um, talk by Dr. Bott is about opioid use disorders and pain, a very um, a uh, common uh, topic and one that we all often have many questions about. So the objectives are to summarize the effects of comorbid opioid use disorder and chronic pain on the patient's quality of life, to report how opioid um, treatment therapies um, do not preclude the need for effective pain management, and to describe and apply strategies to manage pain um, in patients who are on medication for their opioid use disorder. So we'll talk about the prevalence. Um, you can see there's a wide range here of the percentage of patients who have opioid use disorders and have co-occurring chronic pain, um, ranging um, uh, from uh, that study you can see earlier on, 37% um, um, up to 64% um, uh, as cited in um, the studies in 2017. So the relationship is bidirectional, but an important point is that pain usually often comes first. And so um, this uh, large um, study looking at patients with opioid use disorder over a decade showed that um, really the largest percentage, so close to 40%, had pain first and then developed an opioid use disorder um, that less commonly um, it was the development first of opioid use disorder, then pain, um, and co-occurring um, at their first presentation of pain and opioid use disorder. And patients also importantly who had chronic pain before the onset of opioid use disorder often had high rates of mental health disorders and other health conditions. Patients with opioid use disorder before their pain developed are also um, more likely to have um, other co-occurring substance use disorder, and also higher rate of infectious disease, namely HIV and hepatitis C. So what about acute pain management? Um, this slide, I know Dr. Bott um, points out that this is, um, he, he got this from a publicly held art on the web, but this is a great depiction of one patient's um, experience of her pain. And you can see there, this is titled Overwhelm. Um, in terms of it really consuming her life um, experience. So we have a brief vignette here, just to kind of put this into clinical perspective. AN is a 45-year-old female whose status post recent so shoulder surgery. Um, she had a history of opioid use disorder and was treated in the past with methadone at two different times. She stopped treatment and both times um, experienced a relapse, um, which is quite common with stopping treatment. She um, was using about a half a gram of heroin two to three times a day, um, smoking it um, before her surgery. So in the periop period, she was on a morphine infusion um, and had a PRN for, for breakthrough pain last um, dose two hours ago. And she's asking for more pain medication and reports that her pain is nine out of 10. She's tearful, um, her vitals are stable and the, um, uh, someone from the, the working on the floor comes to you and, and the quote here is she's drug seeking. She already is getting more pain meds than any other patient on the unit, doesn't need more. And she's also an addict. We don't want to worsen her addiction. So um, this is oftentimes, um, I think, a scenario that can occur um, um, on, on the hospital ward um, in patients who have co-occurring um, pain and uh, substance use disorder. So what are some commonly held beliefs? Um, the acute pain is frequently undertreated in up to 60% in inpatient settings. And the, we see this even more in patients who have substance use disorder. Um, it's in part because that we see um, as healthcare professionals um, more often than not um, that it's really a problem requiring and the quote here is primarily a social problem that requires law enforcement rather than a health problem that requires prevention and treatment. And um, I think I'm preaching to the choir here for sure, but in many situations, um, where we've kind of um, entered medicine with this as the background in our training, it takes quite a bit of work to kind of see past this and, um, and be there for the patient. And this perceived 
um, control that the patients are trying, um, uh, uh, perceived by the providers as trying to control them is then equated to um, blaming them for um, their requests. And it can, they can often be seen as trying to be manipulative and that does not feel good. Um, so you can see here the potential causes and consequences though of inadequately managed acute pain. So lots of things may go into misconceptions among um, nurses and other staff. So um, we have the uh, opi how opioids are portrayed in the media um, leading to other prejudice against patients who are experiencing opioid use disorder, perhaps negative experiences in the past, um, feeling burnt out by patient experiences in the past, and then that lack of formal training um, in treatment of substance use disorder. So all of those misconceptions can lead to under medication of the patient, which in turn leads to unrelieved pain. And that in turn can lead to that list of consequences that you see there, development of more chronic pain picture, um, depression, anxiety, leading to poor health outcomes, social isolation, and a general mistrust of the healthcare system. So what is a suggested approach? Um, accepting the patient's self-reported pain is, is suggested and pain, knowing that pain, um, how people experience their pain and respond to it, that that can vary a lot. Um, and that vital signs are not a reliable indicator of pain intensity. So as we saw in that vignette, um, we, she had vital, stable vital signs, but um, certainly um, would want to uh, uh, um, listen to um, and believe her experience of her pain. And if required, do not withhold opioid analgesics from people who have substance use disorder. So there's no data, and this is what a lot of us fear, that, that acute pain management, that um, treating that um, will worsen um, someone's um, substance use uh, disorder. And untreated pain, however, um, can lead to more uh, cravings and a risk of a relapse. So um, as you see here, two studies um, of um, patients who were on methadone maintenance showed that opioid analgesia for acute pain did not increase their chances of a relapse. And so that can be um, for, for providers, if we're concerned about um, how we may worsen their pain, it can lead to under treatment. And we wanna make sure um, that we're uh, aware of, of that potential, um, the, the harm that that can potentially cause. So, sorry, let, let me just tell, I'm, I'm getting nurse calls <laughs> about patients. Um, let me just tell them that I'm presenting. So, um, also um, thinking in mind of this, keeping in mind the suggested approach that because of a patient's um, co occurring opioid use disorder with their pain, they may actually need, due to tolerance, they may need higher doses of opioids than someone who does not have. Um, uh, uh, opioid use disorder on, on treatment. And also remembering that the risk of respiratory suppression may actually be lower in patients with that tolerance, um, but they do oftentimes require closer uh, monitoring. And please remember that, um, that opioid agonist treatment will treat the substance use disorder, but not acute pain. So they, they definitely, um, there's many times when I have heard patients say that, say they were in methadone, on methadone, stable on it, hospitalized, that there were uh, pain medications were um, not given probably when they were indicated. And probably people were worried about worsening, you know, as these slides discuss, worsening um, perhaps their substance use disorder, but in reality, or, and also assuming that the methadone was treating the acute pain, but in reality, that's not the, not the case. So you wanna continue your baseline methadone dose um, after verifying the dose at the, at the methadone clinic. If the dose can't be verified in patient, it's safer to break up the self-reported dose to a three times to four times a day dosing rather than giving it all at once. Because if for some reason that were not the actual dose or they hadn't taken it recently enough, so had some decrease in tolerance, um, then that would be safer. And then you're going to add in the other short acting opioids for breakthrough pain. So again, methadone is used for analgesia. Um, however, when it's prescribed for that, it's a multiple times a day dosing and it can be prescribed by any provider with a schedule two license. Um, this is not what is prescribed for treatment of opioid use disorder, which has to be dispensed only at a, a, a methadone clinic, an OTP. I'm sorry, I, I must have not 
uh, the slides, I was advancing them and I didn't advance the ones you're seeing. I apologize. Um, that's what I was just talking about. It. I'm sorry about that. Okay, I'll double check now to make sure I'm advancing both. So what about buprenorphine and acute pain management? Um, it's recommended to continue the buprenorphine and to augment with short acting opioids. So similar again to methadone and then to titrate up as needed. The split buprenorphine dosing um, and again that three to four times a day dosing can help um, with uh, pain more and is indeed usually um, how we'll um, prescribe buprenorphine if someone has co-occurring chronic pain and o OUD. Um, but in, in, in the situation where you have acute pain, um, you can increase the dose by 25% and split the buprenorphine dose if they're not um, normally on that split dose regimen. Um, another option, which we're doing less, but still comes up, um, is discontinuing the buprenorphine and switching to full mu agonists. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, another option is switching from buprenorphine to methadone um, to get that full agonist effect. Um, although I will say that oftentimes we go the other, find, find the other uh, cases true where sometimes someone's uh, pain is better controlled with buprenorphine. Um, also remembering that for acute pain, you can use non-opioid medications um, if those are going to be um, adequately treating the pain. And then considering local anesthesia as well can be really helpful, um, such as epidural or nerve blocks. And then certainly re remembering to, um, if needed, consult a pain medication specialist in particularly um, complex cases. So um, we'll just talk briefly about naltrexone um, as that's one of our um, three FDA approved uh, medications also um, for, um, for opioid use disorder and acute pain management. It's really important for patients to carry an, an alert ca card if they're on injectable naltrexone, um, just so that in the case of an emergency, um, they would uh, have uh, adequate treatment for their pain. Um, suggested plan for pain management um, would be that regional analgesia and then the non-opioid analgesics. If there's an emergency situation that requires opioid analgesia, um, that the amount of opioid can be greater than usual. And it's also important to know that the resulting respiratory depression could be deeper and more prolonged. Um, trying to remember if this slide addresses that fent fentanyl is usually the opioid that would um, have the binding capacity to, um, to move uh, the naltrexone off the receptor. Um, as with buprenorphine, the, otherwise the naltrexone and buprenorphine do bind stronger than most other uh, ag full agonists. Um, these patients should be monitored continuously in an anesthesia care setting um, and uh, and the opioid treatment should be provided by individuals who are specifically trained in the use of the anesthetic drugs. Um, all of this goes again to that safety concern um, uh, mentioned above. And a rapidly acting opioid analgesic that minimizes the duration of respiratory depression is preferred. Um, and the patients again should be closely monitored. <laughs> So here's a comparison um, of methadone and buprenorphine, because um, these, again, will usually be what, what, what most of our patients are on. Again, um, for methadone, confirming that dose, um, if, if possible, um, continuing the regular dose. And if you can't, um, then you would want to start low and go slow with the methadone in a divided dose. Um, and you can provide the additional short acting opioids and monitor carefully your patient. Um, and then for buprenorphine, um, there's these two approaches. Again, the second approach there is really what we're um, encouraging um, because uh, it being an easier transition and, and less likely to lead to a relapse if someone has to restart their buprenorphine. But the two approaches, again, formerly more often was to stop the buprenorphine, start full agonists, and then do a reinduction later on. Um, I would emphasize the second one, continuing the buprenorphine and using additional uh, buprenorphine full agonists as needed, um, maximizing your non-opioids. And then remembering that the divided buprenorphine dose seems to help more um, with pain. Okay, so changing gears here to chronic management. Um, and Julie hasn't told me that Dr. Bott is back, so I guess I'll just, I'll, I'll keep going. I don't think I see him there, <laughs> okay. Um, so for chronic pain management, here's another piece of um, 
artwork um, from the web showing a page depicting a patient's experience um, with uh, their chronic pain and I think the, the treatment uh, experience of their uh, need for medication. So some basic considerations um, to uh, remember um, that a history of opioid use disorder is the single biggest predictor of aberrant behaviors for prescribed opioids. So very important to always screen for that when considering uh, chronic uh, opioid therapy. Um, consider consulting that pain specialist, again, particularly in complex cases. Um, the multidisciplinary team approach um, is definitely recommended um, in, in, in terms of um, patients benefiting from their treatment for chronic pain. And then remembering to use the non-opioid adjuvant meds first, um, as you can see listed there, I won't read them through, um, but I think you're all pretty uh, familiar with that approach. And then using non-pharmacologic therapies as well. So CBT for pain, acceptance and commitment therapy, alternative um, treatments, uh, yoga, meditation, acupuncture, um, and then the intervention treatments such as nerve blocks, um, trigger points, things like that, that can be beneficial. Um, what are the um, um, uh, basic uh, points of responsible opioid prescribing. So this outlines it here. Um, and I think um, the CDC recommendations, kind of, this is kind of a summary of that. So being aware of their individual risk factors, using your, um, uh, your validated screening tools, um, monitoring at baseline and regularly for any aberrant behavior. Um, and Part of that monitoring can be your use of urine drug screens, um, checking your PMP, um, reviewing treatment agreements with your patient to uh, make sure also if there's any changes that need to be made, and then always um, co-prescribing naloxone. So here's one more vignette. Um, this time it's a 64-year-old female um, who presented to the ER with dysuria. She was found to have advanced cervical cancer with local metastasis, and there was a need for pain management identified. Um, there was a concern as she had a 30-year history of uh, heroin addiction, um, concerns about injection uh, drug use. She was started on methadone and carefully, uh, slowly titrated up at the um, uh, at the opioid uh, treatment program, and she was placed on short acting opioids for breakthrough pain. So there was close collaboration, which was successful between the OTP providers and her oncologists. Um, so showing that team approach, um, how you, important um, and help, helpful that can be. So in some cases um, where, where methadone um, and chronic pain are involved, the patient's dependence on opioids can be better treated with methadone maintenance. Um, and this can sometimes help avoid that potential complication of precipitated withdrawal. Um, and sometimes because it's a partial agonist, um, it, it may not be as easy to get the effect of analgesia. Again, I've seen it go both ways, I think, especially in cases of hyperalgesia with full agonists, but in some cases, methadone may be um, more beneficial. Oops, there was another vignette. I think this is the last one. So just another picture of what a patient's experience may be. This is a 55-year-old female who's presenting for treatment of her substance use disorder. She has a 12-year history of chronic pain after an ATV accident, a pelvic fracture, and she's gradually increasing doses of opioids up to 300 morphine mill equivalents per day, um, having difficulty buying off of the street, um, going to different doctors. She's experiencing relationship and work problems, worsening depression, anxiety, and her pain is all over worse than ever. Um, in this case, she was uh, did agree to start on um, buprenorphine, uh, suboxone, and um, has that split dose regimen of four milligrams three times a day, which is actually a relatively low dose, I would say, um, for what she had been taking. Um, and sometimes with pain, we do see a need for higher doses, but also occasionally, again, the patient, every patient's different. It may be fine. Um, she may be completely stable on this total dose of 12 milligrams, and she had an improvement in her pain, felt happier um, with her life. So for buprenorphine and chronic pain, um, if, again, if chronic opioid analgesics are required, it may be difficult to get that analgesia um, 
uh, from full mu agonists. And so you might need to discontinue the buprenorphine, but there is um, a subset of patients with chronic pain and a history of opioid um, use disorder that can experience a reduction of pain and of their um, uh, opioid um, misuse of use um, with uh, suboxone maintenance. And again, divided daily um, uh, to three or four times a day um, is often more beneficial for the pain. And again, there's that point that it could also help mitigate possibly if they're having opioid induced hyperalgesia. So uh, I won't read through this list, um, but here's a, a summary of the reasons why uh, buprenorphine might be a good option as a frontline analgesic. Um, and uh, there's uh, many um, reasons um, why it may be uh, safer than methadone and it can possibly be more effective as well. You can see here, um, this slide is showing uh, patient's pain experience um, with conversion of high dose opioids to buprenorphine for treatment of their chronic pain. Um, and you can see here the, um, uh, the morphine um, a milligram equivalent and their pain score. And really for this range of doses, um, the pain before um, uh, was significantly higher than after they switched to um, buprenorphine. So this is very, it can be very helpful. Um, sublingual forms of buprenorphine are not approved for treatment of chronic pain. They can be effective and are often used, but that would not be the reason why you're prescribing the sublingual form. Again, the first line reason is for treatment of opioid use disorder. Um, the buprenorphine patch is approved for treatment of chronic pain um, that's severe enough to require that around the clock opioid treatment. Um, and you can see here the different uh, doses um, uh, that are recommended for that. And you can augment with other opioid and non-opioid analgesics um, in uh, treatment of pain uh, with buprenorphine. For naltrexone in chronic pain, um, the patients with chronic pain who may require opioid pain medication aren't good candidates, um, again, because of that blockade effect with naltrexone and you'd wanna consider buprenorphine or methadone. Um, and I think we're right at about 1230, so that is it. Um.